Hello everyone, I want to share the drush of what I said over in Bismedrish today. Now, we find ourselves, you know, t tomorrow, <laughs> Super Bowl Sunday. Super and, Bowl Sunday. Uh, you know, I'm not a sports fan, Bechlal, it's not something I'm really interested in. I could even go so far as to say, personally, I hate sports. <laughs> which is something I almost never say about anything. Although, you know, we... We, uh, my, you know, my, uh, one of my rebame in high school, he said, you know, we could be thankful, you know, in the old days they had other pastimes and, uh, pogroms and stuff like this, and these days, you know, this is what keeps people busy. Um, Stop it. in any event, Stop it. it's, um, there was a question that came out last year, I remember, that, you know, should a person pray? You know, does God care about these things? And uh, you know, should he pray for his uh, his favorite team to win and things like that? Now, I'll tell you, I'm uh, you know, again, like I said, I'm not a sports fan, but in my in my estimation of how I understand Bye, mommy, it, we love you. We should really, Bye. of course, if that's something someone cares about, he should enter into the world of prayer. <laughs> When he's discussing, you know, doesn't mean necessarily God's going to take aside one another because of the prayer. But for us to understand, we have to understand that God is involved in everything we do. And so, of course, it's, it's worthwhile to pray even for such trivial things that really don't in life. Everything we have to pray for. That's an idea that we have. Every so, and so when you know if that's the what someone's interested in, of course, pray. Now, uh, I'll tell you worthwhile. Maybe I could say it a little better than last time. This year I was Messiah Kedushin in the Chassan. I officiated a and it was Super Bowl Sunday. I said, "Oh, you see, this groom is very wise because so many men forget their wedding anniversaries." And here uh, he picked a day he's not going to forget, the Super Bowl Sunday. Of course, it's a movable feast, so it kind of defeats the purpose, but that's uh, that's my lame uh, attempt at humor. Now, when it comes to um, these type of questions, though, it's really something we can reflect on, that we have this Torah portion. The second tells us that... <laughs> these are these are the, no, these are the laws which you shall place before them. And Rahim says that you should place them before them like like a set table of Sukhanara. It's as, as table set for a Suda. <laughs> Me, not you learn it once twice and you memorize it by rote, but rather you should become uh, involved to the point where you understand it and understand the reasons of okay? Now, <laughs> now that comes. My baby Appy. Baby Appy. Go on that side. And the, okay. Oh. So okay. that comes to bring a question. Because it's, uh, you know, uh, someone who I. Uh, Rabbi Mark. He, 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 he discussed this question. You know, he says that even the Rambam brings that, you know, you shouldn't just say, oh, it's because God's going there. Rather, rather, we should do the mitzvahs. We should try to learn in order to really understand the meaning and the reasons behind the mitzvahs. Now, it's interesting that all, and, he's, and the Rambam even says that people if they don't Come on, get out! If they, if they think, oh, we're just supposed to do things because God says so, and that's it. Now, that's the same thing because I've always said just the opposite. You know, I've always said that if someone 
you know, you open up the, the daily news or something, you know, and it says, oh, the Jews are observing Passover and they eat this unleavened bread because they didn't have time when they left Egypt for the bread to rise. So they're commemorating this by eating the unleavened bread. Now, that's not true. Yes, the reason we eat the unleavened bread is because God commanded, Matzah's Teichel Shivas Yamim. It says the Torah commands us, God commands us in His, in his Word to eat the, the unleavened bread. Not not because, uh, but then He explains the reason why. The Torah explains is because, because of the. You want to take the baby and go another room? You can go another room. That the Torah explains the reason why. One of the reasons, because there wasn't enough time for the bread to rise. So, so, um, so, what's what can we understand from that? Is that really we do mitzvahs because God commanded them, and not for any other reason? Now, so, so. And that's why we not because of whatever we would do the mitzvahs regardless of reason. However, we are supposed to try to understand. So how do we balance take light of another passage we have this week's part that's well known. Often people misunderstand it. Last week's part is actually in this week's parsha where I said what we will do and we will listen. So so, so it understand there is that we will do it regardless of what we understand what what the Torah is. Why we just do it says so nasa we will do benishma and then we'll do it. and I think really it's back to what we started with talking about you know should we bring even real things in our lives to the Torah. Should we bring even trivial manners and, and pray about them and so forth? I remember there was a, a movie I've seen a few times. There was a movie in the 50s called The Incredible Shrinking Man. At the end of the movie, there's. At the end of the movie, he has this whole soliloquy where he, at the end, he says he's getting smaller and smaller. <laughs> Until he um, he's getting smaller and smaller until he gets down to the atomic level, the, you know, first the cellular level, the molecular level, atomic level, subatomic level. And he said that eventually he realized that there is no difference between the infinite and the infinitesimal. And he ends off with the words that to God, there is no zero. And really, uh, that's an idea we have in the Psalms and Tehillim. We're going to say in a few days on Rosh Chodesh, we'll say Hallel. And it says, Mi ka Hashem alokeinu hamagbi l'shavis hamashbi l'lirois b'shemayim v'aretz that who is like the Lord our God who comes down to look to examine the heaven and the earth, really all the universe and the heavens, everything is nothing compared to God. And yet, so, uh, for him to care even about the heavens, let alone the earth, let alone each of us, let alone every, the type of divine providence that particularly Hasidic Judaism teaches, that relates to every molecule, atom, subatomic particle, is under God's divine providence. And the providence is because everything God cares about, and that's the greatness of God. The greatness of God is not, you know, when we talk about a leader who's aloof, who doesn't care about his subject, a greater leader is the one who cares about everybody. And so the greatness of God is that he cares even about the lowest subatomic particles. And of course, he cares about each and every one of, of us, every human, with the utmost care and divine providence. Now, that's therefore reflects that yes, there's nothing too small or too great for God, and in a way, God's greatness is reflected more in his care about the small details. 
And that then answers also this, and it brings us even more into understanding the answer to this question of how do we approach this seeming contradiction of that we should set the laws that they should be understandable to us, we should be able to understand them, but also that we should Nasev and Nishma, we should do. And not only that, but in last week's Parsha, it just says, Nasa without Nishma, we will do. And this week's Parsha also it says again, we will do. And then finally, it says, Nasev and Nishma, we will do and we will listen. So we have to do, do, do before we can listen. Now, the word Shema, listen, is really understood to mean a Lashon of Havana, you of have understanding. To do it before you listen it? That, to, that to listen really means to understand what we're listening to, what what the yeah. Torah expa- explains for us. When we say Shema Yisrael, it doesn't only mean that your ears should hear some sound, but we should really understand what we're listening to. Now, can you guys go away and go in the other room? So anyway, <laughs> the idea of... Can you take the baby in the other room and go? So the idea... <laughs> of Nasev and Ishma, although certainly we have to do things even without understanding because we can really never totally understand the Torah, but we have to try to understand. And the message is Nasev and Ishma. It's Nasa and then Nasa and then Nasev and Ishma. That we listen, we do it, we do the mitzvahs, and then we come to understand it. Because you, when you just open a book and you don't live a Torah life, you don't really understand what the book's talking about. It's theoretical. It's not practical. It's only when you live it that you develop an understanding that's both intellectual and emotional. You could read a book about tefillin, but until you put on tefillin every weekday, you don't really understand it. And each time you put it on, you understand it more. You can read a book about Shabbos, but until you really keep Shabbos, you don't really understand what's going on. But when you keep it, and every Shabbos you keep, you get to a deeper and deeper understanding of what the Sabbath is about. Now, that is then what we're, what we are supposed to do. Nasa, that through doing, we understand it. You give somebody a book to read about Shabbos, it, it doesn't sound so interesting but you bring someone to a Shabbaton who never kept Shabbos before and they experience it then they're like whoa this is Shabbos I want this I don't I might not know all about it but I want whatever this is you know and not only that but if, if our approach is only intellectual and not practical we don't really understand I remember I, a, a friend of mine is a Talmud of the Nitra Rav of the Nitra Rosh Hashiva of Michal Bear Weissmandel. And this gentleman told me, he said that Rav Michal Bear, the Nitra Shiva said many times that he once visited Oxford and he met a person, he wasn't Jewish, and he knew the whole Talmud by heart as a Talmudic scholar, as a college professor, a PhD. And he was an expert in Talmud, and he, not only that, but he knew it all by heart. So he said, you see from there that you can know the whole Talmud and still not be a Jew. You can know the whole Shas Valpen and Kedblabendach Mishkanid. But when we, you know, but we, we have to, of course, we have to learn, we have to try, but we have to also live, which can't just be an intellectual pursuit, it has to be a lifestyle. Now, and that's how we can really understand it because this person, he might have known the whole Talmud, but it wasn't in his heart. He didn't have a relationship with God through those words the way we have. Through knowing what God wants from us, through his halachas and so forth, through living it. <coughs> That's how it gets into our heart. Nasa, that we we list, we do it, and then nishma. Then we can understand it. Then we really can go away. Then we really understand what the Torah expects from us. 
Now, the fact is there are people, the Rechaim HaKadosh brings in this week's Parsha. He says that, he says that people, they might know all the drushes of Chazal, but they don't know the Pshat. You know, I, I myself, I'm a big Amaretz. I'm a big ignoramus, but, but there are people who are bigger Amaratsum than me. They were more ignorant than I am. You know, you think you're an expert at something. I think I'm an ex- expert in ignorance, and then I find someone's more ignorant than me. There was a few years ago, someone, he said, you know, this week's Parsha talks about that we don't mix meat and milk. You don't cook a kid in his mother's milk. A baby. So... He said, oh, all those laws in Leviticus, you know, there's a teaching we could get out of it too. And this person, I don't even know if he was Jewish, and he was like saying, oh, you know, meaning not that we have to keep it, but like there's a lesson. And that's how Philo taught. Now, you show, you see how ignorant he was that he said it was in Leviticus. It appears twice in Exodus and once in Deuteronomy. Never in Leviticus do we have Los Vashel Gedi Bechalavimai. But he was saying, and it was a nice idea, that a person shouldn't get you know, you're teaching someone Torah, they shouldn't get drowned, they shouldn't get cooked in their mother's milk, the milk, the Torah is supposed to be their milk, the scripture is supposed to be milk, it's supposed to be nourishing, and yet it's, <coughs> they could get cooked in it, they could get drowned in it. Now, if you, you know, put on too much, and the way to make sure they don't get drowned, really, is the opposite of what this person was saying, really, by doing, is the way, you know, if someone just reads, and just <laughs> makes an intellectual pursuit, they get drowned in the Torah. But if they learn it and live it, <laughs> that we're learning in order to keep the Torah, and then we keep it, then we come to a level of understanding <laughs> that is much deeper, and that's the idea of Nasev and Ishma. It's not just we do before we hear it. We can't even hear it. We can't even understand it without doing it. And then when we do it, then we can get into understanding those deeper messages before it. But first things first, we got to do it. And that really brings us to another idea in the Parsha. That it says that that, uh, last week's Parsha, I'm the Lord your God who took you out of the land of Egypt from the house of slavery, right? Me base of Vadim. So what does that mean, the house of slavery? Excuse me. Why don't you say from slavery? What's the house of slavery? The, the Yisbach Yisrael, the Alexander Rebbe, said that it means that they felt at home in their slavery. And that's why this week's Sedra begins with the law, the halacha, the din of the Eved Ivri, that this week's Parsha begins, this week's Torah portion begins with the law of the Hebrew servant. And that if he decides after the sabbatical year comes, he's supposed to go free, and he decides, oh, he wants to stay, his ear has to be pierced by the door. So what? what's this? Why should his ear be pierced? Because the ear that heard that he was free should have let him go. Also, the, the incidentally, we should mention that the Kedusha Slevi, Levi Yitzhak, Ben Sar Sashim, Ben Ditch, Schus, Yagin, Lain, and Wutzmase Shabbos, Kedai, to mention the great tzaddik, all the hashpos that come. So he brings in Kedusha Slevi last week that basically, that why wasn't the Torah given when they were still in Egypt? Because they had to be free. They had to leave that base of Odin before they could receive the Torah. Now, the thing is, is. A lot of people are at home in their slavery, whatever it is, in addictions, in, 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 in you know, I, I, there are people, I was a prison chaplain, you know, there are people who, like, they get so used to prison life, they can't exist on the outside. Once they get free, they just, they, they, they just go right back. Now, the thing is, and the thing is really, you know, these days... You know, they have this whole system of prison. What, somebody does some minor crime and they lock them up in prison. Maybe they were even framed for something they didn't do. As unfortunately is very common in society today because there's a whole system, you know. And what happens? They get locked up with other criminals. They don't learn to be better usually. Some people do, but very most people don't. They just learn to be worse. Now, in the ancient times, if someone committed a crime, 
they stole something, they couldn't pay it back, what would happen? They would be sold as, a, as an indentured servant, and they'd go live with a family that would take care of them, that would be good role models, and they would learn a lesson of how to live life, and then when the sabbatical year comes, they would go free. Now, now this, the question is, so what? So why wouldn't he want to go free? Well, he has a comfortable life now. He has, he has a roof over his head, you know, like, I've seen in a lot of old movies the same joke. I know Charlie Chaplin did it, Delore and Hardy, Abbott and Costello, all of them did the same joke, and the Bowery Boys, whoever it is, that they tried to get, a, they, they had nowhere to eat, nowhere to sleep, so they tried to get arrested so they at least would have a meal that night, you know, and everything they tried backfired on them. You know, some people, they just, they don't have an idea. I heard when I was a prison chaplain, the inmates told me a story, I don't know if it's true, but the idea is like, pretty crazy, you know, the, the people, illegal aliens who come over the border, commit a crime, go to a federal prison, work for Unicor, and, uh, and they'd, not Unicorn, Unicor, and they would, uh, they would make the $300 a month, so here in America, that's nothing, but like back in Mexico, in the little, in the little town where they lived, that $300 could go a long way, so, so let's say they kept for themselves 150 and they lived pretty good in, uh, as far as other prisoners, and then, and then they give send back home to their family, and they also, and they said as soon as they get out, they're gonna go, come back over the border, commit another federal crime just so they can work in Unicor, and send and send money back home to Mexico, and that's what that's what our, our taxpayer money is going to here in America, the waste of the the the, 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 the prison systems. People who, who they should have just been sent back to Mexico. Now, <coughs> now, the idea of um, again back to what he said. They should have heard. They should have learned after these. All right, they had to go through maybe up to six years. As, a, as an indentured servant, so they should learn a lesson of how to live life. And then they get better, and then they improve their life. Not say, oh, I want to stay as a slave. There's a certain point, we have to grow up. You learned your lesson, and now you got to apply those lessons into life. And so that's when you go from the Bechinus Eved, from the level of a slave, a servant, to the Bechinus Ben, of being. What did you just do? of being like a child to God, and so that's what God wants us to be. Ben is, look what you do, you spilt that seltzer. Is Ben is a lashon of Havana, of understanding, Lahavin, Bina. That you can, that you can understand. So yes, we start off doing as an Evan Hashem, but then we become a Ben Torah, a Ben Aliyah, that we, we come and we can understand what the Torah wants from us. And so, an, a, a mature person will want to understand the reasons, but will understand that also that he has to still do everything. He can't. He's not exempt like Philo or others taught just because of this. And now the thing is, you know, this week's Sedra, it says that if you find a trefa, you throw it to a dog. Now you would think, that if the dog didn't do his job as a shepherd and, he, and, and, a, and, a, and a little sheep got eaten by a wolf, why would he get to keep, get a reward for that? He, he, he didn't do his job. Now the answer is because all the years he did his job and one time he, he messed up. You don't just look at the negative aspect that he messed up one time. You look at all the good that he did over the years. And so too we have to have and it goes back to the beginning of what we said. We have to have that appreciation of understanding everything is under God's control. And so we should pray for every little thing. Even you want to pray for the Super Bowl, or you want to pray for whatever you want to pray for, some silly little thing. There's nothing wrong with it, just the opposite. It's to remind us we have to constantly pray, constantly, not that we're going to get what we pray for necessarily, maybe yes, maybe no, but the point is we have to remind ourselves that it's God who's in control of everything. 
And so again, there we come to that idea of a deeper understanding that Nasev and Ishma. Not only that, but when you pray for everything you do, you're going to realize if you're praying for something trivial, it's not a bad thing. If you're praying for something wrong, you're going to get embarrassed. And then you're not going to want to pray for it, and then you're not going to want to do it. And so that's also a way to protect us from the wrong thing. If we're always constantly praying, and that it might even help us to pray that we shouldn't do the wrong thing and we should start to do the right thing because we enter into a relationship with God of constantly, constantly talking to God. Not just saying our prayers three times a day, but talking to God, like Nachman Breslover and other tzaddikim said, like he's a good friend, the Briskarov and other tzaddikim, they all said that we should take time to be misboided and misboined and, and think and talk to God and have our own personal approach to God. And through that way, again, we come to Nasa Venishma, that we, we do it, and then we can hear it, we can listen. And the schus of that, we should be zoiche to what we said in the Mus of Kedusha today, Yashmienu, Brach Mavsheni, Slainikolchai, just like the first time. It was a big deal. There were much more people at Har Sinai than even who were going to be at the Super Bowl. And so we know it was true that God spoke the, the, uh, to, to, to us at Mount Sinai because there was millions of people there who all heard God. And, and, and Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 32 tells us, it dares us to check, did any other religion make this claim? And they didn't, that the whole nation should hear God and live. So we know that it's true. And, and it's, so it's not just a matter of faith, but a matter of historical knowledge. There were more people at Mount Sinai than whoever, for example, met George Washington or Sir Isaac Newton or any other historical figure that we, that we talk about and we accept that they existed. So there were even more people at Mount Sinai than whoever met any of these people. So we know it's a historical fact that God spoke to us at Mount Sinai and, and He wants us to live this life of nasev and nishma, of doing. And then through doing, we come to the level of nishma, of understanding and understanding in a deep way the messages that the Torah has for us, the lessons that the Torah has for us. We can inculcate them by doing them. You know, we who keep the separation of meat and milk have an opportunity to understand much deeper than this person who's saying drushes who doesn't just uh, who does <laughs> who doesn't just um, who doesn't just um, you know say something you know because the drush 